podcast devoted to analyzing films and what makes a movie a movie. I am your host, Alejandro Mendoza, a filmmaker, podcaster, and lover of cinema. Today, I am joined by Nathan Mandeville. They are a teacher, half of the review crew on YouTube, and a lover of cinema. And today, they have selected Joel and Ethan Cohen's No Country for Old Men. Hey, Nathan, how are you doing today? I'm doing pretty good. You know, I'm exploring the city of New York um, where a bunch of movies were filmed. And so we've been exploring all that. We just went to the Empire State Building and got some pictures with Spider-Man and stuff. So it's been a pretty good day, honestly. Um, yeah, at, at Southwest Plug real quick, if you guys want to check out the uh, review crew on uh, YouTube, my wife and I kind of go and talk about movies and just laugh about bad movies. And sometimes we talk about good movies as well. Um, not so much as uh, Raul, because Raul knows so much about movies, and i <laughs> very intimidated sometimes, like, coming into it, but I, I know he loves movies, and I think he, he realizes I love movies, too, so I'm, I'm very welcome to be here, and I'm, I'm very happy and excited to talk about this movie. Yeah, man. I Look, I choose people to come on this show because I feel that they have something to say about movies, and they have a very big passion for cinema, and... Don't worry, you're here for a reason. I wouldn't choose you for nothing. Thanks, man. What? Well, how are you doing? I'm doing all right, bro. I, you know, I've been pretty busy with work. Uh, we, you know, at the university, it's spring break, but they have been shooting a project over there right now. So I've just been there helping them out. If they need anything, they need some certain gear, they have to go and get it for them. But mostly, it's been a pretty chill uh, break. Not too much for me to do. You know, here and there, I have to grab something for them or, like, open something for them. But more than, like, I just, it's been, it's just been chill. Like a chill spring break? That's good, man. The weather's not, like, kicking your guys' <laughs> ass over there? Dude, Houston is, Houston is just, is just <laughs> terrible. Hot. <laughs> One minute it's hot. Another minute it's cold. <laughs> Today it was raining, and now it's getting cold again. Mm. So, you know, weather's been pretty bad, but um, the good thing is that a lot of what they were shooting, the uh, what's called weather was good for them. So that's the good thing. So I that's didn't. That's good. That's all that, all that matters. That's all that matters. Can, yeah, can, yeah. Yeah. But um, other than that, just, I've been doing okay. I, I know y'all were in New York. I, I'm glad that y'all were been, uh, you know, kicking it over there, having a good time. And uh Glad that we were able to, to do this because I have been wanting to get Nathan on here for a while. Um, I know I told Marissa for sure, his wife, that I said, like, dude, I need to get do Mr. Doctor on a, on a, what's it called, um, on an episode of something. Like, I have to, I have to. And, you know, Nathan, I asked him once and he said, man, I'm pretty busy with my, you know, wrestling schedule. <laughs> and, like, I'm pretty busy with this stuff. But, like, I'll let you know if I'm open. This time the spot was open and I said, bro, I need someone. Can you do it? And what did you say? I'm on it. I'm on it. And um, I'm really happy that you're here, bro. I, I know that uh, I, I'd love to do a dual episode with you and Marissa, but obviously you guys are not <laughs> in the space right now to be able to do a dual episode. So uh, we'll have to just wait for maybe season three for that. But I know that Mar I have Marissa down to come on an episode two, but I'm really happy and I really thank you for your time for coming on here. Yeah, for sure, man. I'm happy to be here. Yeah. Also, by the way, great job on the channel. Uh, I I love the channel. Oh. You guys are doing great. One of the best YouTube banners out there, y'all. They keep it really simple. It literally just says, "We like movies." <laughs> simple and to that's, the point. That's basically it. Yeah, man. You know, if you like movies, come watch. If you don't like movies, you could just look at our beautiful yeah. faces, maybe. But uh, yeah. it's yeah, simple and to the point. Yeah. And I know you like I, I was watching them and they were like, what's it called? When you were like, oh, I was going to watch this. You're going to be like, what? What did you guys choose? I'm like, yeah. I'm just here to have fun. I just like to watch <laughs> y'all guys. You know, I, I you know, I, I'm not going to rain on y'all's parade for enjoying something. <laughs> I'm just I'm just here. I'm here for the ride. I'm just glad <laughs> to see y'all two on something. Yeah. Yeah. We're really happy. You know, you, you, you definitely like kind of helped. Uh, bring that because I, I know I love movies and I'm like I wish I had a space to talk more about movies and when Marissa started talking about that I was like dude we got to have Raul on too just so we can get him that would be a good one so she can talk, have like an actual discussion about real movies because she wants I'm sure she wants to know how the 
how the making of movies goes and and all the the, the backgrounds to it you know what i mean yeah it's a lot that goes into it it's not all yeah. just like wow this is a perfect movie it's like oh, there's a lot of stress that goes into it too yeah oh man it's it's a it's a good type of stress though um yeah i just i like i've been i've been i'm like i said this movie that you chose this is a pretty like pretty special movie right now because this is a movie that i'm studying at the moment for a uh neo-western crime thriller that, I'm, that i've written that we're going to be shooting that's going to be the next film i'm going to work on if time permits because there's another idea that i have uh cooking here just recently started working on that we might shoot as like a little in-between project with uh with this next script but you know making movies isn't easy it's but like you know a lot of things in life aren't easy uh just making movies i'm sure that like from the outside looking into people who don't even watch movies all that much, they think like, "Oh, you need to go to school to do this." Like, wow, I'm like, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, you, you know, it's 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 pretty hard to make a movie, and <laughs> yeah, there's so much that goes into it. Yeah, and I'm glad that you guys want to what's it called, uh, have me on so you can learn a little more about it. Even though there's some stuff that, like, to be honest, I can't even give you much insight on. It's just the way <laughs> it is. Like, I can't even like. You know, like that's because you you watch good movies, man. We watch all the shitty ones. You like all the ones that get like thrown by all the fives and fours on IMDb. Those are our kind of. <laughs> that we watch. I get subjected to some pretty bad stuff. You forget <laughs> you forget that I have a job as a critic as well to make sure oh, yeah. that I watch everything in the year and I offer my critiques <laughs> on them. So you know, I wouldn't say you know movies like Firestarter last year were good, <laughs> and I had. <laughs> Like, yeah, so everybody always thinks that, like, oh, Raul gets to watch all the good stuff. Oh, like, Raul, all the good stuff. like, all that Raul does is sits down on his nice couch and watches uh, Tarkovsky on the TV every day. It's like, no, that's not what happens. Sometimes I really have to watch some pretty bad stuff because... The, but that but that makes you appreciate the good stuff even more, yeah? No comment. <laughs> but um, today, Nathan uh, selected... No Country for Old Men, and No Country for Old Men is directed by Joel and Ethan Cohen. We've already introduced you all to Joel and Ethan Cohen on a past episode of The Cinema Condition. You go listen to that episode with Alex Flores and myself as we discussed The Great Lebowski. You can check that episode out. It's available on all services like YouTube and, and uh, audio podcast services. I love that movie. I love the, the Cohen brothers, so I was happy that, that um, Nathan chose another Cohen brothers film. And, um, yeah, man, I, I, I don't think I can really, like, hold this off any longer. I really do want to talk about this movie because this movie's, this movie's so good. And, like, I've always said, like, it doesn't really matter whether I like the movie or not. It helps out a lot when you bring out a movie that I like. So I think today we're going to have ourselves a pretty good conversation. But because we've never talked about No Country for Old Men, let's go ahead and introduce you all to this movie I wrote a couple of stuff down here. It was a lot of information on the Wikipedia page, but I tried to summarize it down and get the meat and bones for y'all. So let me go ahead and tell y'all a little bit about Joel and Ethan Cohen's No Country for Old Men. The development of this film goes all the way back to Scott Rudin buying the, the, the rights to the original novel by Cormac McCarthy. But at the time, Joel and Ethan were stuck trying to adapt a different novel to this big screen. Come August 2005, the Coens signed on to write and direct the film adaptation with Joel Cohen stating that the film was familiar, the, the book was familiar, congenial to us, we're naturally attracted to subverting genres. We like the fact that the bad guys never really met. We like the fact that the bad guys never really meet the good guys. And that McCarthy did not follow through on formula expectations. The Coens decided for their adaptation to stay faithful to the source material. Literally, one of the brothers would type the script while the other brother held the book open from end to end as they looked at it for ideas to write the script to. Yet, they made adjustments and changes where they felt it was necessary. Uh, one of the big necessary uh, changes they saw was kind of the way that uh, Llewellyn's wife was written in the book. She has a little bit more of a prominent role within this movie compared to the book. Josh Brolin found himself nervous with lack of dialogue for his character stating, I meant it was a fear for sure because dialogue, that's what you kind of rest upon as an actor, you know. Drama and all the stuff is all dialogue motivated. You have to figure out different ways to convey ideas. You don't want to overcompensate because the fear is that you're going to be boring if nothing's going on. 
you start doing this and this and taking off your hat and putting it on again or some bullshit that doesn't need to be there. So, yeah, I was a little afraid of that in the beginning. The film was shot in New Mexico, Texas, and the Mexican city was shot in Coahuila. Cinematographer Roger Deakins approached the film with less emphasis on stylization but kept it dark and realistic. Joel expressed much interest in the way the brothers approached directing. I can almost set my watch by how I'm going to feel at different stages of the process. It's always identical whether the movie ends up working or not. I think when you watch the dailies, the film that you shoot every day, you're very excited by it and very optimistic about how it's going to work. And when you see it the first time you put the film together, the roughest cut is when you want to go home and open up your veins and get in a warm tub and just go away. Wow. And then it gradually maybe works in its way back and somewhere towards the spot that you were at before. Thus, the neo-Western classic was born in 2007 when it was released, and the film would go on to win multiple awards, including the Academy Award for Best Picture at the 80th Academy Awards. And there was also a... Best Actor win for Javier Bardem for this role, making him the first Spanish actor to win the Best Actor Award at the Academy Awards, along with other stuff. And just that is all she wrote about this film. It's quite the film, y'all. It's a very big movie in 2007. Like, it's funny, Nathan. I know, I know like, we don't concern ourselves here with the review and all, but I do want to say, in 2007, I was really young. But there was one thing that I remember being discussed heavily in 2007 by people in my family, grown-ups, and just like friends. Everybody was talking about No Country for Old Men. And then in 2008, when it wins the Oscar, I remember hearing about this movie everywhere. I mean, I would go into Hollywood video, and everybody would have, like, No Country for Old Men up there. Like, oh, like, No Country for Old Men was this big. So this movie really hit the zeitgeist. Uh, in 2007 and 2008. Uh, Nathan, I do want to ask before we actually get into the conversation about the film, why did you choose No Country for All Men specifically? Well, I, I think the same thing. I watched this movie at such a young age. I was probably my pre-teens, 11, 12, 13. And um, I remember, you know, my, my family wasn't really big into movies, but they watched the movie and they loved it. I don't know if they loved the style of the movie or just Javier Bardem's haircut. <laughs> but they like love the movie and <laughs> the scenery and everything. So when I watched it, I was like confused. I was like, this movie's so boring. I don't understand like why anybody, I mean, I was only 12. So I was like, I don't understand. I didn't really like movies back in the day either. I had ADHD as a kid. Um, so I was just very like hyper. I was like, I can't stand to it. But as it, like, as I grew older, I started realizing that that movie, like it stands the test of time. Like it's such a, 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 a work of art honestly like that you compare to movies now um even uh uh neo-westerns now or, or movies that are shot like that i think of um like sicario even which was made almost 10 years later but mm -hmm. the see, like shot for shot like the, it's so comparable because it's so influential and and like unique so i just i just thought hey you know what that's uh it's a pretty good thematic movie that's almost on the nose because when when you listen to it the dialogue is pretty simple it's not really like big head turning ideas big twists but it's just kind of laid out all in front of you and it's uh so i thought like it'd be a, a good discussion to talk about you know yeah for sure man um i remember us discussing this movie when i say us i'm talking about the nerd court with uh, me and brad we we actually discussed this movie not too not too long ago uh, when we did our uh, Joel and Ethan Cohen month, when we did our month on the Cohen brothers, we brought this one up, and I just, God, I remember falling in love with this movie uh, because I never watched it as a kid um, because they didn't let me. Um, I remember when I was in the room when they were, my family was starting to watch um, The Departed in 2009 from Morris Scorsese, and I remember the only shot that I got to was literally when they're on the beach and they shoot that one girl in the head. And my dad was like, you can't watch this. And my mom was like, you can't they watch wait. this. They wait till that moment, though. <laughs> They're like, oh, just got you. okay, now you can go. Like, now get you out can of go, here. yeah. So, like, you know, I didn't get to watch No Country for Men either, even though that came before. But, like, I remember, like, that was, like, one movie where I was, like, I had heard about how 
big this movie was and like how it won the Oscar. And like at a young age, even though I didn't really understand what the Oscars were, all I knew was like it was this big award show that was happening. And I felt though like I still kind of understood that it was a pretty big deal to win this award. And I remember throughout my head, I always kind of thought like, I want to watch No Country for Old Men. I want to watch. And once I started like my my like my film journey, where I really started to take movies a little more seriously, once I started to watch stuff that wasn't like, you know, sh stuff showing at the multiplex, I started to like really think about like, oh, I want to watch No Country for Old Men. But then I started my podcast, and that meant that I had to like watch all these other things, and I didn't get the chance to actually sit down and get to watch this movie until oof, later when we did our Joel and Ethan Cohen month, and I finally got to watch this movie. And I fell in love with it, man. Where the point, like I said, I'm sitting with my producer in our Zoom call. And we were like, okay, we need to get some neo-westerns down. We need to look at it. And I was like, okay, Hell or High Water is one of them for sure that I wanted to study. Like there's a lot of stuff in there that I really want to bring to the table when it comes to the, the nature of how I'm going to direct this next short film. And then I also thought like, oh, no country for all men. Like, if there's a look that I kind of want to emulate a little bit in this next film I'm working on, I was like, dude, it has to be No Country for Old Men. I do want to make the film a little bit dirtier. I do want to make it a little more rougher to look. I want to make it look a little more grimier. But I was like, dude, like No Country for Old Men has everything that I'm looking into wanting to adapt to my script right now that I want to like work off of. And like you said, it, stood, it really did stood the set of time. To the point where I'm trying to use it in 2023 as a movie that I'm uh, as a movie that I'm studying to go ahead and use in my next month, it really does show how much it stood the test of time. Yeah, I mean, th I feel like this is the movie that <laughs> it's hard to like face other movies out because you're like, hey, you want to watch some uh, neo western movies like that are just like that, but it's like none of them are really as good, and so you're yeah. just like, oh, that was like that was amazing, but I like this one was. Like it, it's it's like the pinnacle of movies yeah. in this in a sense, you know what I mean? And so mm -hmm. I think that um, I'm excited for what you're saying. Like, kind of want to watch a more gritty version of it. So it sounds kind of cool that you're you're making like something as similar, you know? Yeah, yeah. Like what we're trying to do is like what I explained to my DP was like, hey man, I want to take No Country for All Men, but get the lens a little dirtier. Like really, like we have the audience look at the frame. And be like, I feel disgusted by what I'm watching. Like, not necessarily look as beautiful as this movie looks, because it does look beautiful. Like, Deacons does a great job here. But, like, how can I make this movie look a little bit more grittier and a little more dirtier? And that's us trying to take the frames and make them a little, you know, get some dirt up in there. Or the presence of the blood being a little bit more present and... You know, all these other things that I will definitely discuss on off air with you because that's a little bit more of, of a different conversation. But there's a lot to this movie that I'm just looking at that I was like, oh, like this is kind of what I want to do in my next short. But without further ado, are you ready, Nathan? Oh, I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready too. Let's go ahead and get into our conversation on Joel and Ethan Cohen's No Country for Old Men. So we start this movie off, and we're really going into the very Western landscape, of course. I mean, this is a neo-Western, and there's a lot going on here. There seems to be a situation with the cartel, if that's kind of what's going down. Like, you know, the, this, there's three vehicles. Uh, they get into a shootout, but one driver is left alive. But... While this is happening, there's also Javier Bardem's character, who uh, I never understood how to say his name. Nathan was like Sugar. It was like, uh, I think it's I, I think it's di pronounced differently, Chagrin maybe. Chagrin, but yeah, because yeah. I, I know that Josh Brolin does the Sugar. Like no, <laughs> yeah, Sugar, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, Sugar, Ch Chirug, or whatever his name is, I'm gonna call him Sugar. I'm oh, gonna call sugar, Javier yeah. Bardem Sugar, or I'll just say Javier sure, Bardem. Yeah, <laughs> Javier, Javier Bardem's character uh, is going around and terrorizing, like you know, the city. It, it, and at first, you don't think these things are 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 connected, but our inciting incident commences here, and it seems that our main character Llewellyn has found himself in kind of a sticky situation. He goes to these three vehicles and he takes the two million dollars. 
that are in the in the vehicle. And um, but here's the thing: good guy Josh Brolin comes back at night and kind of regrets his decision and decides I'm gonna bring this guy water because that's what he was asking for, only to find out that of course, bro, come on, Llewellyn, you're leaving him overnight. He's not gonna freaking survive. <laughs> he's he's, yeah. he's he's bleeding out. He comes back and nice that's gesture. Yeah, and that's where this whole crap starts because the cartel gets there. And they find out that, he, what's it called, he's running off with the money, he goes on his chase, and so we enter into our big discussion here where a lot of this seems to take place is about No Country for All Men and how it really does start this idea of the neo-Western because neo-Westerns have been a thing since like the 70s. But to me, the neo western genre doesn't get perfected until 2007. Until 2007, with this movie, um, there's a lot of different things between the neo western, and I have always been interested in, in like the difference between the western and the neo western. Even though there's not a lot of different things about it, but there is a prominent difference. So in the old west films, you'll look at like, oh, it's the cowboys and Indian films, right? You know, you have your John Waynes, you have your, um, you know, your films like Searchers. Um, there's also another movie that I really like from that's a western, and I don't know if you've ever seen it, but it's Ida Lupino's Hitchhiker. Uh, really good film. Uh, that's a, a western as well, but that's where it started to kind of take more of like a different approach to it. But when you think about western, you think about those John Wayne films, right? You know, like The Searchers, right, is one of them, and I'm blanking on these other ones, but um, you know what I'm talking about. Oh, Stagecoach. Stagecoach yeah. is one of those as the well. Good, the bad, the ugly. Good, yeah, just big yeah. trench coats, just yeah. like ready to, to root and toot and shoot. And yeah. And then all of a sudden, like, we move into, like, the later part of the millennia, and we start going into, like, the 80s and the 90s. And in 2007, this movie comes out. And you start looking at, like, oh, the landscape has kind of changed. So in, in these films, you start seeing more of an emphasis on the border on, you know, the U.S. and Mexico is one of them. Um, you still have bits and pieces of what would make the Western film the Western, right? You have the trail. You have the moral ambiguous characters. You have, of course, the Western landscape, right? And you still have, to a sense, the cowboy and, and you know, the, the villain, which would be in this film, the cartels. But you also have, like, other movies like Logan, per se, which is also a Western. Uh, another one that comes to mind, it's a neo-Western as well, is or High Water. There is no what's it called cowboys and Indians in that film. It's just, what's it called, two guys who are running from the law against the sheriff. And then you have a movie like uh, Cuaron's Kid. I can never remember his name. It's, uh, Carlos, Carlos Cuaron's Desierto in 2015, which is a movie about immigrants who are crossing the border. And this one lunatic guy played by Jeffrey D. Morgan who is trying to kill them before they can make it to the United States. So you have all these movies come out from this neo-Western genre. And specifically, I wanted to ask about the way that it's kind of uh, approached here in this movie. What did you think about like about the, the whole approach and the introduction of the neo-Western in Neo Country for All Men? I think that the um, the way it's introduced, it's almost like like you said, it's it's way different than the typical Western where there's good and bad and good usually prevails over the bad. This one almost starts like a, a three-way kind of a triangle, almost a four-way because the, the presence of the cartel is always there. And that, you know, that's a big part in the movie later on in the movie. But like the, it, it, to me, I see it as kind of like, um, you have your lawful good Tommy Lee Jones character, mm -hmm. right? As a sheriff. Then you have, um, you have, uh, um, how do you say Llewellyn? Llewellyn? Llewellyn. Llewellyn, because it's country. Yeah. Llewellyn. Not to be confused with Lewin from Lewin Davis, another Ooh. Coen yeah. Brothers film. Yeah. Yeah. Llewellyn. Good movie, too. Llewellyn. Yeah. yeah. Which, um, and then you have him who's kind of, you know, he flip flops sometimes, you know, sometimes he does something bad and then he's trying to take a good, uh, do a good deed. Um, and so he's kind of flipping every now and again, like some things that he does, he makes mistakes and sometimes he doesn't. And then you have kind of the embodiment of chaos, in a sense, um, which is Javier Bardem's sugar. Uh, so it's like, it's tough. It's tough to see all that stuff come up. And, you know, you don't, 
that's why that his character is so like charismatic because you're like he's not entirely evil he's just chaotic and the themes that he brings with them kind of make sense that's what makes him such a bad character into it to a specific degree but um yeah i think it's i think it was again revolutionary almost and a lot of these movies nowadays kind of take influence of that and it's like hey we don't have to have just a perfectly crystal cut uh, a crystal cut mean hair or clean haired guy um it can be kind of ambiguous with the, with our characters um where they're not fighting like the worst most evil thing in the world where they're just kind of living in the world and the you know the the turmoil of the world is getting to them breaking them down breaking their character yeah and i would say that you know the characters in this film are more morally ambiguous than the the ones in um in, in the old west i would even say that this movie kind of takes a page out of the noirs in a way because it's like you know, the more ambiguity is even more present in this. Because like you said, uh, Llewellyn, there's moments where like Llewellyn is completely in the right here. And then there's moments where like, oh, crap, I don't think I agree with Llewellyn here. Like Llewellyn's not going about this the right way. And specifically, like, you know, how he gets his wife involved in this and like puts her in harm's way. And, and then you have moments like, oh, where Tommy Lee Jones is just this character that to me within the confines of the Western – would be like the perfect rendition of the sheriff, right? But he's also one of the more like guilty characters who's just watching as all this goes by. And he's like, at the end of the day, I cannot control what these two are going to do, even though you hold the biggest position of power in your city to go ahead and stop this. And he's just watching as all this unfolds. And like, and that's why I think to me, and I know I'm skipping ahead here, but I think that's why that ending monologue hits so different uh, in, in, in the last part of the film. It's just kind of Tommy Lee Jones referring to like, <laughs> I just gave both of these two power to just hunt themselves and do basically what I'm supposed to be doing and create this, um, this atmosphere and this, um, and um, this, what's the word I'm trying to say? This landscape where, the good and the bad guys are not even where the good, the bad guys are not being stopped by the good guys. The bad guys are being stopped by these people who are like in the middle where like the, and to an extent, Nathan, like the definition of justice kind of gets construed a bit. Yeah. I would say the same, man. Like definitely he should serve as a, like a presence of justice and, and, and all that stuff. But like really, the retribution isn't that simple in like today's i mean today's modern world but um the movie kind of goes into that like has it always been that simple is it always been so black and white in the sense that good has always overcame evil or is it just like you know people do the things that they're gonna do and and we can't really stop it and so it it really he he does a great job i mean Tommy Lee jones of i mean because maybe because he's so old but he does such, that's just an amazing <laughs> amazing job <laughs> but like he made me so bad i was just like oh my god like this poor old man um and so i had to go watch something like uh you know batman batman forever to go be like okay yeah. he's just a crazy he's a good actor um but he he does such a great job of embodying that like time is really the enemy of everything because it's just like beats us down and it, and it, it hurts the pride and it hurts uh, it, basically our own self sense of awareness and um, he does such a great job. And I think you explained that perfectly, man. Like, it is more so like the bad, the bad per se, is not being stopped by the good. It's more so just being stopped by the even worse or like the people in the middle where the good people are like, what is a good person, right? And so it, it's it's really, it's a good movie to to really put that on, um, on uh, to portray that really. Yeah. And... I, you know, when it comes to the neo-Western, especially like that, then that's a key point to me because Westerns are always about justice. It's about, you know, the cowboy who's going to come in and he's going to, what's it called, um, you know, liberate the city from like the presence of the Native Americans, which by the way, what's it called? We could have a whole separate discussion about how the Western is a really problematic genre in there because there is a lot of movies back then that also like, I know that the neo-Westerns concentrate a lot on the border in Mexico and all that. But even then, there was a lot of movies back then in the Western that were, like, highlighting Mexicans as a really, like, 
really like bad people and like the, the the native americans too like they would label them as so bad and like we need to come in and we need to liberate these uh these these people from like the presence of the the savages and like it's just yeah they really <laughs> had that white savior uh kind of idea where it's yep. just like oh this is the guy yep. like he's, he's white as day white as day and it's like is it shouldn't it be sunny outside should you at least have a tan or something yeah and it was just it's it's very um very interesting conversation that we actually could get into it, but that's that's a whole big. Maybe when you come back and you want to choose, like I don't know, stagecoach or the searchers, maybe we'll talk about that. But like at least in the confines of here, uh, the emphasis is more so placed on on um, on this Texas town, but they also kind of put a lot of emphasis on Mexico. Um, they actually crosses over to Mexico at one point. I, one of my favorite scenes mm-hmm. in this movie is where Josh Brolin is like, like what's it called? Obviously, like, he's bleeding out and he's having a hard time here. Man wakes up to being serenaded by mariachis. <laughs> yeah, that, that part was so funny. And I love how they play until they re- realize that he's, like, bleeding and they're like, oh, like, okay, let's stop playing. <laughs> yeah. But they help him. They help him at least. They could have just been like, okay, like, let's get out of here. But gives them money and then they take, they take him to the hospital. So it's pretty interesting. Yeah. And, 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 like, you know, the Wild West is now, like, oh, we're, invi- we're involving, you know, the border now. We're involving what's on the other side of the border. The saloons are now motels. You know, no one's hanging out at the saloons, drinking beer. Now, now it's, the, it's the motels, the cheap, dirty motels where people are running from the law and people are, what's it called, uh, staying there to, um, to, what's it called, shoot a bunch of people. Like, there is the, the, the presence of violence in this movie is very brutal. Um, like just the way that he uh, that that like that l- sugar kind of approaches to killing some of these people is a little like really brutal. Um, I, I especially I'm thinking about when he thinks that uh the Llewellyn's in that one room barges in. Well, first of all, it doesn't barge in. He has this oxygen tank that yeah. sucks in the freaking um lock from the doorknob, which to me. At first, when I first watched it, I was just amazed. I was like, what the heck? Like, you can do yeah, that? Like we, yeah, like, we, we kill animals with that thing? Like, what's going on? Like, that's such a strange device. It's so, like, it's almost, like, foreboding. Like, oh, my gosh, that's not typical. If it was a gun, we'd be like, okay, that's a gun. Yeah. But it's not, you know? No, it's just a simply an oxygen tank, reversing it so it could suck in that doorknob, opens the door, shoots everybody in plain sight. But... I was just like, really. Um, I'm sorry. This the my dog was just knocking at what the fuck? My dog knocked at the door. Fucking hell! He doesn't. He doesn't have one of those oxygen tanks now. He's like, no, give me doesn't. food. No, she <laughs> doesn't. I hear you talking. I want to be in game. Oh. Yeah. Love. No, but she what's it called? She start barking and shit. No, I can't do that. <laughs> or worse, bro, she start biting on something. Yeah, just what all your wives are gonna be like, oh my god. No, no. <laughs> She'll have her own time for a podcast. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that no, I think that that he, him carrying that thing, lugging that thing around, because you know he's he's got to freaking carry that thing everywhere he goes. So it's like it's wild for him to just take it, and people probably just like, hey, what is that guy carrying over there? Uh, yeah. you know, yeah. At least with a gun, you can kind of conceal it, but he's just carrying yeah. that thing around, shooting doors open shooting at people left and right and it's just in it's insane man it's insane yeah um but i, I that scene that you're talking about he shoots the lock and you know um uh uh josh brolin's character is there llewellyn llewellyn, llewellyn. he's llewellyn. got the doors down right yeah. yeah yeah and so and so like that such i mean He's kind of like waiting and it's almost like the build up there and you're like, oh my gosh, they're going to, they're going to meet, they're going to shoot each other. Someone's going to die, but it builds on for such a long yeah. time throughout the hotel, back into the hotel. And it's just kind of like, it's a trip, man. Yeah. It's really, it's really a trip. And that's like, to me, and I, I know we're still on this conversation of the Neo Western, that's really where this movie, like these movies kind of differentiate, differentiate between like the old West where like these movies aren't afraid of being brutal. Like, Mm. At the top of my head, what I what I remember, like I told you, Hell or, uh, Hell or High Water, uh, Desierto, Sicario, Logan. What do all those four movies have in common? They're all very much not o- preoccupied with being um, 
clean. They very much present the threat of the violence. And in a way, like I said, it reminds me a lot of like the, you know, Martin Scorsese pictures, like the, what's it called, like The Departed, Goodfellas, and in the way that like Marty isn't afraid of showing violence like that. But it was, it's really interesting to see it how in like, how in the Westerns, it goes from like these movies where like, oh, you obviously have these war scenes with like the Indians and the cowboys and they shoot each other. And then you move into like this modern version of the Western and everything becomes a little bit more ugly. It becomes a little bit more brutal. We're not afraid of showing that much blood and really detailing how like, how uh, genocidal isn't the word. More so like very homicidal, right? The West is. It's not this beautiful landmark it's not this like very romantic view of it that you would see in the old west. It's kind of ugly. It's kind of morally ambiguous, and it's a very violent landscape. Yeah, and I think that they're the the way they're not afraid to shy away from like someone getting shot. Usually in the westerns, old westerns, someone gets shot and then they do a twirl all the way down. Yeah, yeah. and they don't show blood. They don't show anything. But like here, they'll get shot on the neck they'll get shot oh in the stomach God. and it'll just show the blood yeah. squirting out and the the, the the point of view from that is just like oh my god like and then the sound they're design. really showing it the sound yeah it's amazing like, <laughs> yeah like, like gargling for their lives and you almost and we can go into that too with with javier bardem's character um sugar he's like he almost feels no empathy for that and you think like we're looking at it like oh that's a bad guy like that guy kind of was a weirdo and he's there dying, and it's just kind of like, okay, like, let's play a different scene. Go to the next scene, please. Like, it makes us feel uncomfortable, even though, like, we see these very horrible things happen. And uh, it, it, it's, it's, really, it's really good, man. I mean, that makes it more real, more raw, you know? Exactly. Um, that I, I 100% agree with you. It makes it more, more real, raw uh, look of what this, like, the South and the American West is. Because, like, like I said, like those old ones feel very romantic, um, and the way like that's kind of what was so different when it came to like the spaghetti westerns. They weren't really occupied, like preoccupied with that. Like they were, they were like, no, what's it called? We're gonna do something completely different from that, and we're just gonna like we're still gonna keep to the tropes, right, of the west, but it's not gonna be like these like John Wayne pictures. We're gonna do them a little different here, um, but when it comes to like these new ones and like especially this movie here like it's 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 brutal it it shows all this blood it shows the violence and it's just like like i like i i think about it like you said like like and i don't know why it's just coming to my head so much maybe it's because i just love this movie so much but like it reminds me of sicario in a way like sicario is like another movie that's like so methodical because that's the only way that i could explain really the direction from joel and ethan in this film it's like it's very pa they're very patient when directing this movie but with that patience also comes like moments where they're like, okay, where is it where I can go balls to the walls here and just show off just the amount of blood and violence here? Because like my mind goes directly to the first shootout scene uh, when they find each other, Llewellyn and, and Sugar. Like they're just hunting each other down, like to the point where like Brolin can't see Sugar. Like Llewellyn can't see Sugar. But he's seeing them come in. And then, like, Llewellyn will stop the car, tell them, like, don't worry, I'm not going to hurt you or anything. I, I just want to, what's it called? Um, I just want to get out of here. And boom, that guy gets killed. And Yeah, it's, it's almost immediate. It's immediately, like, they're, there's, they're going back and forth, butting heads so much that the people in their way are just casualties, you know? Yeah. But, um, yeah, like I said, the, the neo-Western genre is always one that really interests, interests me. Uh, it's one that I felt has perfected the Western in a way that it hasn't before, it's especially because like I, like everything in cinema has to evolve. We have to be honest here. You know, everything has to evolve, and this is probably one of the first biggest trends in. Well, not the first. I would say noir is the first one, but the second biggest trend in American cinema is the Western. And for it to finally get modernized like this and for us to get movies that, like, don't concern themselves with showing, like, <laughs> you know, the American as the saving grace of the American West. And it's like, no, like, sometimes these characters can be bad. Sometimes these characters could not be in the right. 
and sometimes our definition of of of, uh, of justice can be misconstructed, and within the confines of uh, of No Country for All Men, it really does showcase that. Yeah, and and you know what? It's crazy. You being from the area, you living in Texas, you know, like you have to live with that stuff yeah. every day, basically, right? You're just like money. There's trucks, cartel trucks being abandoned, and you're like, should I steal it today? No, I'm not gonna. Yeah. It's not. It's not as present as people make it out to seem. <laughs> yeah. Man. Like. Yeah. So the media likes to really over exaggerate. Like, I see more border patrol than I've yeah. ever seen the cartel <laughs> in cartel, the in yeah. Texas. But I also yeah. think about you because, you know, like y'all are in, in Arizona and Arizona is also a part that like, as, you know, it hasn't <coughs> been as mentioned in the old West films, but like it's still part of the American West. Yeah. 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 I, yeah. I have people. I mean, um, Arizona is such a, a, a pretty terrible place to live, too. Not because of anything. It's just so it's hot the over there. The scorpions. It's, yeah, all the scor- yeah. The scorpions, the snakes. And then it's just so hot. But um, yeah, I have people telling me like. Oh my gosh, it must be so horrible to live where I live in the border town. Uh, and I was like, no, it's fine. There's nothing going on here. They're like, no, I see it. I see it on the news. And I'm like, nope, I'm not here. that bad. Like, it's not not that bad here, you know? Or they'll go, oh, I watched 310 to Yuma. And I'm like, <laughs> that was in like the early 1900s, 1800s. I'm like, uh, nope. That Yuma. movie's set in like the old, old, old <laughs> way. Like, it's not what it is here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's in that, and you know, man, like, I will say that movies like Sicario are the ones that get it right. Because, like, I would love to sit here and say, oh, that's a stereotypical look of what it is. No, that's how it was. That, that's how it was now. It continues to be. Uh, not really in my town, where I'm from, but, like, you know, you go, and, go, into the, go into the streets of El Paso, anybody who was living there around that time, ask them how terrible it was with the influence of Ciudad Juarez in the, in the, in the presence of the cartel. They'll tell you, yeah, so you got it right. And yeah, and that's what I mean though. These these movies do a great job of like taking that influence. They're like, hey, we're not gonna sugarcoat it to you on either side. We're gonna show you the, the worst parts of both. And yeah, like I said, like Sicario falls into that, right? And in the way, and this is gonna go perfectly into the next topic that I have here that I wanted to go into. Uh, and I and I, I know that I have them kind of labeled in the notes differently. Uh I put them down as the way that they come into my head, but the way of the flow of the conversation, I kind of mix them up here. But yeah. I know you wanted to bring up something about Sicario, right? What did you want to say? I was going to say, you know, they both have Josh Brolin in it, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's why. <laughs> Tex- He's the everyday Texas man. Yeah. The everyday Texan, uh, Thanos as well. You know, I yeah. I, oof. I, I think in my head, would, would keep would Llewellyn be able to outrun Thanos? I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't think so. No, he's that's someone that's a that's a presence that can't be yeah. stopped. Maybe Sugar. Maybe Sugar might have been able to take I down think Thanos. Sure, yeah, they needed to call Sugar in that first Infinity War. Yeah. I think they would have got the job done. Yeah. So here's uh, this movie also falls under a little bit of a not genre but classification of movies uh, like Hell or High Water that I call the thrill of the hunt movies uh, because mm. these movies have something very different than the other Western films. Here is where Joel and Ethan Cohen really subvert the genre because usually you'd have the, okay, good guy is hunting down the bad guy because bad guy did something bad. But like I told you, in that one scene after the motel, the perspective changes. Sugar is now the hunter, and he's hunting Llewellyn. Yeah. Where before it was Llewellyn who was hunting Sugar. And I thought that was really interesting. It really does flip the switch, per se, right? It really does change the perspective of how we're supposed to be looking at specifically justice, in a way. It's like, oh, both of these two have their own motives. And... To an extent, are they both right in their motives? It is left to the, of course, the audience to decide that. But I wanted to ask you about that aspect about the movie. What do you feel about, how do you feel about that where, like, the perspective does change? You know, that that's a pretty, uh, like, important piece of the movie because before you were having, um, you know, Josh Brolin kind of go around and kind of get into just these these situations, but... 
after that, it really does make it seem like Javier Bardem is almost the main character of the movie. Like, I know he got, he won his award for um, Best Supporting Actor, but it's almost like he was leading the movie in the sense that he was, he had the motive, he had the, the, like, the material to, okay, like, give me back the money and your wife's going to be all right. No, I'm not going to say the same about you. But Josh Brolin then and takes it and is like, no, his pride gets in the way. And mm -hmm. so then he becomes like, I'm not giving up anything. This is my money. I've already gone through so much. And Javier Bardem, that's really when he starts taking life. Like before, he was almost just like uh, a, a, a presence, like doom of, of fate. And he really goes into like, okay, he, he starts having fun with it too, where he's like, I have a motive now. And I, I don't just want to get that money back. I want to make this guy make sure that he pays for it. Like not just yeah. like, like uh, uh, literally and, and, and figuratively, like he's going to pay for not only shooting me and making me like injured, but also yeah. like he's been making me go in this little rat race so much. Yeah. So I, it's, starts, I mean, it's amazing. He also starts to get like uh, Woody Harrelson's character involved in there. Right. And like, like, uh, which by the way, uh, I, I forgot that he was in this movie. <laughs> I just like I had just watched um how, what did I what did what, like I I like immediately remember him in Triangle of Sadness. So like I watched him here and I was like, "Oh crap, I forgot what he was in this." And I but you know, that's neither here nor there, but I just wanted to bring that up because it was just like, "Oh, it was so fresh in my mind that he's like he had seen he was in Triangle of Sadness." And all of a sudden like I see him playing like a freaking what's it called a a, a police officer or something like that and I was like, "Oh crap." Thank you, man. Yeah. You know what's funny too is that we were just talking about the Planet of the Apes. He's in that movie he's too. That he's in movie the third too. one. Yes, yeah. Yeah. War. Yes, that's yeah, what I also we'll, yep. saw him in. Yeah, War. We we just watch a bunch of movies with the same actors. <laughs> like, yeah, wow, these. <laughs> Hollywood isn't as, as as big as you all think. You know? No, yeah, they just yeah. got the same five white actors, and they're like, let's keep running them through. Can you tell the difference between them? That's the hard part. part. But, yeah. um, <laughs> but um, <laughs> yeah, like Sugar starts to get uh gets him involved and then once like he's of no use like Carson Wentz is of no use to him anymore boom shoots him down and I think to me where he really starts the like the shift actually ch happens other than that uh, scene from the motel is when Javier Bardem's character has to take care of his wounds and you know he oh man one of the most badass film scenes in that movie is when he freaking gets the tie, puts it into the gasoline, you know, hole where you're supposed to put your gas into, lights it up, walks into the pharmacy like a badass, and takes the tetanus shot and all that stuff. And it's like, what yeah. the hell? I remember watching that when I was a kid in the commercials, and I was just like, I think this is a scary movie. Like, this has to be a scary movie. That's just, like, so intimidating. It's yeah. a badass scene, but it's like, that's so crazy. Yeah, and like I love the whole foreshadowing about that because like earlier they those two other police officers, uh, the sheriff and the other police officer looked at a car and they were like, "Oh, like I wonder how that happened." And like you know, and I love how that one of them says like, "We should have brought some weenies, sir." Like, shut the fuck up. Um, yeah, yeah, I, that just shows you like how behind like they're like two steps behind, three steps behind these characters, and they're just yeah. like never gonna catch up and like that's the part that baffles me in a way like these are supposed to be the surveyors or whatever you want to say of justice right like they're yeah. the ones who are supposed to be handing justice they are part of the system that is supposed to be working to protecting those who are getting harmed and they can't be yeah almost makes you uh <laughs> yeah it makes you almost have lack of faith in the system you know yeah hey and that and rem like that's a big part of this movie too, where like yeah. you saw that Carson Wentz uh, was that's what even his name I think I'm talking about a football player when I say Carson Wentz. I no, hope I'm not. Yeah, Carson Wells. 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 Carson Wells um, is working with Sugar, and it's like, oh, here we go. This is the part of the corruption that is inside of the system, and just it's it's <laughs> I just like my my mind can't get off of that. And also, I would say that um. I'm pretty sure that Deacons gave that idea to um, to Vianu in uh, in Sicario when they did a scene similar to that with the car bomb. Um, 
because I was like, this reminds me a lot about Sicario, that scene. And I was like, oh, okay, maybe, th- I mean, Deacon's also shot, you know, uh, Sicario, so he probably was a little bit of a help to, to the Vianuva there. It's like, hey, let's, uh, I don't even know how to do a Vian- uh, what's called a, a Deacon's impression, but, you know, hey, let's, let's do it like this. And, but, um, yeah, and I think that's really where the switch happens, too. Is like he's tending to in his wounds, and to and, and in a way, I don't know if you read it like this, Nathan, but Sugar kind of enjoys himself, like tending to these wounds. Like you look at the way he's like kind of reacting, and he's like, "Oh, like somebody is finally fighting back against me, right?" It's like I finally have somebody who's willing to like put a bullet in me because like I'm so used to me doing the what me doing that. Yeah, he he. It, it's um, it's like a game of cat and mouse, but this this mouse was also willing to fight back, and so he he likes it. He like it brings him that joy, man. And uh, I I definitely did when he's in the bathtub and he kind of like it's like yeah. a sigh of relief, like he's like oh yeah. And I totally got that. And you know what's what's funny is um, right before that scene, uh, we got Woody Harrelson's character Wells talking to Josh Brolin, and he's saying um. He goes to him and he says, hey, this guy is going to get you. Like, there's there's no ifs, ands, and buts. He's going to get you. He's going to get the money. Just tell me where it is. I'll figure it out. And um, Roland's really, like, reluctant. He's like, no, I can do this. I can fight. And he's like, no, he, this guy doesn't care about whatever. He's going to get you any way he can. Uh, he is like a, a crazy – he said he calls him a sociopath. And um, what I like about Wells' character is that Woody Harrelson, he, he gets hired and within, like, a few hours he solves every he like finds the money gets the guy and he's just like well that's it for me like i'm done (laughs) right he basically had the he had the movie solved and that's why he's kind of forgettable in the movie he's only in it for like 20 minutes like a a handful of scenes and it's because it's like well he's so good at his job like that guy himself is just so amazing at bounty hunting wasn't gonna kill anybody he's just like nope i did it like that's it uh but then he he gets to Javier Bardem's um, sugar, and he's just like, "Damn it!" Even when they're walking up the stairs, he's like, "I'm gonna die! Like this is it! I can't, I can't fight my way out of this one! Like this guy's got no morals. He's got no like way to to be convinced. Um, especially when he has that bloodlust." Yeah, yeah, and I mean, just Javier Bardem also plays that psychotic character so well, and he really does show that he's psychotic because, like, like you said. That sigh of relief, in a way, kind of gave me chills, too. When I first watched this movie, I was like, dude, there is no way that this guy is enjoying this right now. Because, like, he has shotgun bullets in there, man. And he's like, and you see where he, like, puts the tetanus shot in there, like, twice. Gets out of the shower, does it again. And it's just, it, it finally shows that, like, oh, this guy who was used to hunting down, like, was being hunted down finally has somebody who can, you know, put him in that position. And once he's in that position, he finds the thrill of it and being like, oh, now I remember why I like to do this. And Yeah, yeah, it's great. <laughs> yeah. It's, um, and it's also why Bardem is also, like, one of my favorite actors of all time. I mean, he's in my favorite movie of all time. I mean, he's a guy's, guy's genius. I also forgot that he was uh, marketed, uh, that he was campaigned for Best Supporting Actor instead of Best Actor. That's that's kind of crazy because I wouldn't even put him down as a supporting actor in this movie. This isn't. No, I, I wouldn't either, man. Like, he does such a great job. Yeah, like, this, he 100%. That's, that's, he's in it as much as Brolin is. Yeah, I would say he was, he's even in it more because Josh Brolin kind of is not in the, the, yeah. that last third of the movie or like, yeah. I guess a fourth. Yeah. And he talks. I think he has more lines of dialogue than, than he has more. Yeah, he has more dialogue. I would say. I would again. Yeah, I would say he is the leading. I mean, he is, yeah. his face is there on the front. His his is the most. Mem- it's tough, but I'm glad that he won. You yeah. know what I mean? Oh, he Whatever deserves it. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, and um, yeah, just a little tangent there. I'm sorry, y'all. I just so, sometimes to me, like the Academy's whole like campaigning you know like it's stuff weird. it's weird like I, I will never understand it like and then you have stuff like this year where like Barry Keoghan went down as supporting actor 
even though like he's in it for like five minutes like but yeah he's not in it for very long i mean yeah. um or john I think hirsch the, john hirsch was in it for one scene in the fablemans <laughs> did not and I, I did not understand that because i don't even think that scene was particularly the best scene in the movie because <laughs> i was just like okay i felt like uh you know paul dano did a pretty good job too like can you at least throw him in there but um i guess yeah. not man it's so interesting it's so interesting how all the... that works but um going back to this um yeah and like i said joe and ethan cohen always have that kind of like motive within their movies like the way that they kind of subvert genres uh man i like fargo fargo is in your run-of-the-mill noir and it's kind of like it's kind of funny at times too like they make it really funny um, the Ballad of Buster Scruggs isn't yeah. the run of the mill western either. It's not a neo western, but it's no. like it's this really weird type of film that like has parts that are western, parts that are like also kind of in a way German expressionist. Like, like yeah, I, musicals, like musicals, there's so much. Yeah, like they always do that thing of like subverting the genre there, and in this one, it's really present throughout that relationship between Llewellyn and, and Sugar. And I just, to me, that's that's the part that stands out to me the most. Uh, and it's the part that I take away the most is just how the perspective changes. Because you never see that in movies, like, prior to this one. Like, all that much. Uh, even, like, like I know I brought up The Hitchhiker, Ida Lupina's The Hitchhiker. In that movie, it's, it's simple and cut down. There are two people who are running away. And there's one guy who is trying to, what's it called, a... Uh, to um to hunt them down so that way you can get the money. It's pretty simple. Um, but in this one, it's like, oh, at first we think Llewellyn is the guy who's going to, you know, go off with his money, you know, he's gonna what's it called? Um he's gonna what's it called, um, hunt down uh, and kill uh, sugar and make it out alive. It's the whole reason why he even sends his wife out to Odessa. And then all of a sudden once the the, sh the the shift happens, it's like, oh crap, no. I have to get my wife involved now. And like my wife's mom gets involved too, which also I do. <laughs> I, I have to bring it up. I really do. When she meets that one member from the cartel and he tells him, well, I haven't seen a Mexican in a suit like that. You never seen a Mexican in a suit like that. I'm like, yeah, she said that. I was like, gosh, dang it. I hope you die. <laughs> oh man. And what happens? She dies. Yeah, she dies. Yeah. Well, you know, what's funny though, is that, I think you're right in that sense where it kind of flips it on said it went from like a traditional three like three acts mm -hmm. movie to like oh well, let's split the second act up and let's make it four acts because it's like we yeah. have the introduction of the characters we have the the chase and then it's like oh nope now it's the other chase and yeah. then the ex the, the the last part of the movie and so it it really does a good job at showing that where it's like you get both perspectives and it does leave it like ambiguous like oh hey look at you know, Josh Brolin, going back to it, Josh Brolin is kind of like, he made a mistake, but now he's on the hero's journey. He's going to make it out with the money with his wife. And then it's like, oh, shoot, no, he doesn't want to give up that money. Uh, like, okay, I guess we're rooting for Javier Bardem now. Like, don't know why, yeah. but we almost want him to be like, I want them to meet again. I want them to have one last showdown, yeah. which they don't even get, which is the yeah. great, like, to me, that's the craziest part. And I think that's Joel and Ethan reminding us, like, this isn't your good, the bad, and the ugly. You don't get your Mexican standoff. You know? You're j like, these two are not going to meet again. And that's perfectly fine because, like, Tommy Lee Jones explains it at the end in that monologue. He's like, sometimes it's left up to fate. You wake up in the next morning and it's like, it happened. And... Go, no, go yeah, ahead. no, I, I, I just, I think that that's so cool because, like, going back to where he talks to to Wells and he's like, Wells is like, hey, I can get you the money, like, we, we could just walk, you don't have to do this. He says that like three times, and he's like, get you the money, and he goes, no, I know where the money's gonna be. It's gonna be placed on my feet by the end of whatever this is, like this story. It's gonna be on my feet because, because, uh, Josh Bowen's character is gonna give it to me. Yeah. But we don't even get that. Like, we don't get that satisfaction. So he wasn't even right in that sense either. Yeah. And it's like, in a way, like, he's kind of, like, not even concerned with the money anymore. He's like, I'm concerned with the fact that I was just embarrassed. Like, 
all this time, like, we don't know how long it's been that he's been working in this, but it's safe to say that for, like, the last 10 years, right, nobody has ever gone into him like that. And it's like, forget the money. Now it's about making sure that he remembers that I'm the one. Like, I'm the boss. I'm the one who what's called supposed to be doing this. I'm not supposed to be hunted down. You're supposed to be the one because I'm the bad guy. But because that switch is flipped and because our perspective changes on Bro on Josh Brolin's character, Llewellyn, we start to wonder, like, what does this story even concern itself with anymore? Ah, man, that's that's literally my when I first watched the movie, that was my first impression. I was like, what is the point of all of this? Like, especially when Josh Brolin dies, you're just like, oh, my gosh, I've been following this movie for almost two hours and I didn't even get like a satisfactory like ending or, or like kill. Like he didn't have a hero's way of shootout where it's just like, oh, he saved someone or he it's like, no, that's <clears throat> the characters themselves aren't really the most important part of it. Yeah. It's more so like, hey. This is just the way things are. Yeah. Like, this is it. it. It like it's the movie's more concerned with like the land the, the landscape of where they're at. Like yeah. like the system that's in place. And mm -hmm. because like you know, it's such a minuscule part, right? But it's very it's a part that speaks a lot of volumes when like when uh when Llewellyn's trying to cross back into the United States and the border patrol is try is like asking him like a thousand questions, like well, like, what's it called? Like, oh, are you part of the army? No, I'm a veteran. Okay, where did you serve? Oh, Vietnam. What's it called? Well, what battalion were you in? Blah, blah, blah. And it's like, oh, what, what tours? Oh, 1967 and 1968. And it's like, like, it's it's not concerned with, like, that, like, the cookie cutter narrative of the good and the bad guy. It's more so concerned on, like, the police department's, uh, uh, what's it called, part in all of this. Uh, why they're so? Why it's so hard to get Bro jo Llewellyn back into the United States, but it's so easy for Sugar and the cartel to have a presence in the United States, even though they're coming from Mexico, and also like this, <laughs> this interesting uh, part that's also talking about pride, in a way as well. And I just, I, and that's, like you said, like, at first, you would think, like, oh, what the hell does this movie want to do? But it's, like, it's clear as day in there. Like, Joe and Cohen really just put it there for you, and it's, like, you're not, it's not really about the two dudes in this, guys. It's about the atmosphere, the landscape, the, um, and the, and the, and the society that allows people like that to brew out. Yeah, it's definitely, it's, it's, like, reflective on the systems of power that are in place there mm -hmm. especially uh, and it's you know I'll, i again we go back into it but like people think oh that must that's the texas arizona that's a southern thing and it's like no it's everywhere everywhere yeah. where there's people yeah people with power people that abuse the power um then you get people that like uh just ca are chaos through it all i mean uh, a good a way of seeing that is also like just watching Batman, like, if you want to make believe situation, like, that's also yeah. somebody that em em embodies chaos and just is a circ is uh, a victim to their circumstance, right? It's mm -hmm. just a product of the environment. And that's what this movie really is. It's just like, here's the environment, here's all the different moving pieces. And it's not like nobody's the one main character of it all. Yeah. Um, and that's why it's like, that's why, like, on paper, right? It feels like those, these certain scenes I'm about to bring up aren't important, but they kind of do show how, like, even the bystanders are involved in all this. Like, the first one that I'll remember is when he's on the border, and he's trying to, like, walk over. Uh, he meets those three. Luella meets the three, and he's like, hey, how much money can I give you for the, what's it called, the shirt? And it's like, oh, well, you know, like, uh, 500 bucks, can you give me that sh the, the coat? And he's like, okay. Also, I really find it funny that he asked for the beer, and the guy's like, well, how much you want me to give the beer? He's like, just give the guy the beer. Um, and then Sugar gets into that same situation uh, towards the end of the movie where he has to ask this little kid for his shirt, uh, his coat, I'm sorry, his, like, flannel to, like, hold up his arm. And, um, and like, that, like I said, that also kind of brings up, like, oh, like, the bystanders have a place, uh, bystanders have a play, uh, place in this, all, in all this, too, because, like, they're the ones who are watching all this happen. And to, they're, like, confused. 
but now they're kind of like directly involved in it. And I know that this movie isn't like completely a discussion on the drug war, but like I know that other movies would like put this into like, oh, they're the ones who are also kind of living through this violence. So like this whole time we're concerned only with Llewellyn, uh, his wife, his mom, and what's it called, Sugar. But we don't stop and think about like this stuff is actually happening to people in this movie. Like that bomb, like the the, the fucking tie bomb going off in the in, by the pharmacy, people are getting injured because of that. And it's like, like, and that's where I feel like Joel and Ethan also go like, yeah, guys, think about that too. Like, think about the environment that everybody is living in and how like all of this is being shown. And it's like, yeah, you would understand why some people go into this life of crime because they see things like this happening all the time. They see that these guys are literally running around with $2 million in a briefcase. It's like, I want to have $2 million in a briefcase. <laughs> yeah, man. I, I they Whoever they did for the casting or just the people in general that of Texas were so like, I don't know if they just picked them off the street like, hey, this is a... Uh, this is just some people crossing the border these days. Like, let's just grab them here because they, the, the, the scene in particular, the, the, um, the store clerk man. Oh. That guy does such a great job. I mean, that's such an a tense scene. You yeah. know what I mean? But that guy does. That guy should have been nominated for best because he does such that, a great that, job. Like yes. he's like an everyday, like person. You know? Yeah. Like, yes, thank you for bringing that up. And, uh, and that's a great segue into our final topic here. We'll talk about the whole, like, role of fate in this movie. But I'm glad you bring that up because that guy is, like, so innocent, by the way. He's just, like, he's just the regular guy who's just sitting there. He's running his store. And out comes in Sugar. And he's like, flip a coin. We're going to flip a coin and see if you die. And, like, I think in the back of his mind, the, the, the clerk knows that he's talking about getting killed. But he does such a great job at being still confused as to like what the guy is, what's this guy talking about? Um But yeah, that guy that guy should have been what's it called, um uh campaigned for best supporting actor. Cause oh my god, he is better than uh the police officer that joins Tommy Lee Jones. He's better than um <laughs> than what's it called, um any of the other guys who are like being campaigned other than Javier Bardem, like that guy really showed out. He said, Oh, I have one scene? Bet. I'm gonna show out. I'm gonna make it the, yeah. And he did yeah. on one take too. He was just like, All right, I'm out of here, guys. I'll be back in my trailer. Which also, by the way, I would like to say that this movie is part of the little universe of movies that feature villains that like drinking milk. <laughs> like yeah. Clockwork yeah, Orange. Clockwork Orange. Love the milk. Uh, Blade, uh, not Blade Runner. I'm sorry. Um, um, Ma Mad Max Fury Road. With the guy with the. Oh yep. Yep. With the guy with the milk. Yeah. The, he liked the ladies with the milk. Yep. Yep. Uh, sugar is one of those villains. Milk, so is, milk. <laughs> milk is just a evil. It's a evil drink. Yeah. It's the drink of the devil or something, man. Which, by the way, so, uh, <laughs> I have to bring up when they first go into that trailer. And they went to go see that the milk is there. And he's like, oh, it's been sweating. What oh, is yeah. it with that guy who's with Tommy Lee Jones who goes, well, damn, Sheriff, we just missed him. <laughs> yeah, that guy is so, he's so flamboyant as like a that deputy is, or whatever he is. He needs to die. Like, I was like, dial it back, bro, please. Like, what yeah. was, like, what was that whole, like, performance there? Um I wouldn't even describe it as fanboy, more so like overacting it a little bit. He was yeah. like, well, damn it, Rob <laughs> Sheriff, we just missed him. Yeah, it's like they said, like, hey, we need someone complete opposite of Tommy Lee Jones who's like brooding yeah. and mulling things over. They were like, just be over the top, do it, do everything. Over the top, like the very, like, um, what's a good, what's a, uh, not over, the, I'm trying to think about the word here. I would say like the very, like, optimistic. Um, yeah. optimistic rookie in the force because like you yeah, have Tommy Lee Jones who's like I've seen all these years of like the force and I've seen how corrupt it is I've seen how like sometimes yeah. these situations are out of hands and also next to me is this deputy who's like really excited to catch the bad guy yeah yeah then that's probably why Tommy Lee Jones is like man I got it because we're all gonna die if this is the guy that's gonna replace me yeah <laughs> <laughs> he's just all but, sad um, about it Fate is also a big part that plays into this movie. Of course, the first time we even see Sugar, he's 
leaving the fate of what's it called um of the store clerk to a coin flip. He does it again to um to Llewellyn's wife, which I love the way that they kind of cut that off and they're like, did she die? And then she's like, oh, she comes back again. And we're like, oh, okay, all right. She obviously didn't die, but like, or did, did she, I'm so sorry. I'm I'm kind of forgetting now. What did she didn't die, right? No, I think they they left it ambiguous. But then um, Javier Bardem checks his the sole of his shoes, and he always does that in the before or after he kills someone. <sighs> um, so they're kind of implying that he's he she he killed her. Yeah, but. Like yeah, so you know, he, he like the whole play of fate kind of gets in there. Uh, also, just the whole like the fact that Llewellyn even gets involved with this. It's like yeah, it's, like it's just something no, that happened. It, yeah, and and that's what I mean too. Like he you he flips the coin to see like okay, you know what? I'm not gonna be the deciding factor. You have decided yourself based on your circumstances, the situations that have brought you up to me. And that's what he always says. He says, just like this coin, this coin got to you here the same exact time, uh, same exact way you, you got here, right? And so it's gonna it's gonna choose fate. It's gonna decide for you whether you live or you die. And um, um, you know, you can see uh, Josh Brolin's fate, like you know, war veteran. Uh, that's just down on his luck. I mean, this guy. He said that he said he's a welder in the in the movie too, but like. Obviously, he's down on his luck. He's living in the in the in the uh, in his trailer. Yeah. And like he is so tempted by that to take that money, right? Sure, to find the money, and it's like that's that's fate. Like, okay, he does a bad thing. He takes the money, but then he says, "You know what? I'm gonna do good." That guy wanted water. I'm gonna go back, give him water. It's probably a little too late already, but, but like, that's just fate because he gets there. Horrible timing. Horrible then timing. It's a, then it's a. It, yeah, then it's a it's a little uh, it's a little race there, um, and that scene. You know, I just want to bring up that scene. What do you think of the scene when he's in? He goes in the river because he gets shot. The guys mm-hmm. are chasing him down. It's Don chasing him down, and, and the that dog. they stick the dog on him. <laughs> yeah, when he has to come out, he takes the water. He takes the gun apart completely, and it's very patient on that. The dog is just a very well trained dog. Yeah, uh, my dog would have probably touched the water and been like, "No, I don't want to be in no. there anymore." Um, but, uh, th- yeah, that's what this movie also has a odd um, inclusion of. There's a lot of parts in this movie that involve dogs getting murdered. Oh yeah. So like, yeah, I would say so. Too. In the first part of the movie, you know, with the dogs that are just dead, and then like yep. the dog that was sent to them, like, I mean. I don't know if I could read into that. Maybe it's a way of saying like, oh, look, your innocent animals are also going to be murdered here. Just like, you know, I innocent think, people. I think that's what, yeah, that, that, that is what, like, because a lot of people don't, they don't really like um, familiar. I mean, they don't, they don't reflect on someone dying as much as just like, oh, okay, a person dies in a movie. It's fake, whatever. Right. But when you see a dog die, you're almost just like, oh my gosh, yeah. like yeah. that dog. Yeah. That, that dog didn't do anything. He was trained. To kill people, which is horrible, or to attack people. Yeah. Um. But like, he didn't have a he didn't have a choice, and that also kind of goes into fate, where it's just like, okay, are people the the do they have the fate in their hands? Are they deciders? Do they have free will, or is it just yeah. like this is destiny? And it's exactly the way. Like also, you know, you would you would, if you go a step further and you think about it, like all of those who are involved in the uh, in you know, um in the cartel here, let's say those people have kids like they have no choice to be involved in this, but because they are their, 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 um, their kids, they're automatically involved in this. And if you like look at Llewellyn, right? Like, Oh, Llewellyn's involved in this. That means automatically Llewellyn's wife is involved in it. Llewellyn's mom's wife, wife's mom is involved in this. If they were to have kids, they're involved in this. And it's like, it all comes down to like, in a way, yes, Llewellyn probably shouldn't have taken that money. But for a second, I don't believe that he's a welder. I think that he had not been working for a while. And fate just put him at the right time to take money. And he decided to go back because he felt bad. And he at least wanted to give the water to the guy and be like, hey, I might have taken your money, but I want to give you the water. And what happened? Fate also played the part where it said, hey, I'm also going to put you in a really bad situation here. 
and you're gonna, and it's gonna be the reason why you're gonna be hunted this whole freaking movie. Yeah, man, and I think that um, the wife Carla Jean she does uh, a pretty good job at playing that kind of um, like childlike, I would say, um, opposite to to Josh Brolin. Yeah, where he's kind of like he's burnt. He's like he's like burnt down with society. Kind of uh, he's quiet. He chooses words carefully, and he's kind of just like rugged, beat up by the world. Um, and I think you're right, man. Like thinking about it, like I don't think he was a well leader. This guy was probably like down on his luck for sure. Yeah. And um, I I don't know, man. Like she does such a great job portraying that. Like okay, like hey, I'm what you have looking forward to coming back home. Like we, she's probably happy with her life right there. But he's like, no, I want more. I need more to provide for everybody, to provide for myself. Yeah. I'm tired of being like this. And it's 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 such a powerful like idea that fate is like it could be a giving thing, but it also could be like something that takes from you. Yep. Something that takes from you. Yeah, exactly, yeah. man. It give and it gives and it takes. You know? Like it obviously takes his mother in law, it takes his wife, and it's just but it also gives you like <laughs> Two million dollars in a briefcase for you to be what's it called? Get yourself back on your feet, and it just it's it's something that could either it's it's a double edged sword, right? You know, it's, it's just something that could either like freaking kill you or it gives you the best thing ever in your life. There's no there's no middle ground anymore. And and that's what I think is the most interesting part is that like it isn't it's not biased. It mm -hmm. really isn't. There are certain where you, because you, you are born into your seven senses with this at a dice roll, and it's like, okay, some people are born poor, and some people are born uh, rich. Like the cart, like you said, kids of the cartel, and it's like they didn't choose that; they were yeah. just get, given the hands of fate. And um, it's interesting, man. Like he, he, and the way he takes that opportunity, he's like, okay, fate has given me like this money, like I'm gonna take it, and I'm probably who knows what he's done with it, right? But then that becomes the factor if it's like, okay. Now you're you're reaping the repercussions of it, um, and the interesting thing is, he, uh, Javier Bardem's character, is almost that personified version of like he is fate. He is mm -hmm. like okay, this is your fate. I am your fate. Yeah, I'm going to kill you and get that money back. Yeah, and that, that's why he says it like all your past actions, everything that you've you've lived through, it's led to to the reason why you're in my way. Right. And like, that's what exactly he told Stork. He's like, because I'm flipping this, I'm flipping this coin because everything you, you've done in your life has led you to this. And it's like, at surface, at surface, <laughs> what's it called, level, it doesn't really make sense. But also, it's like, what's it called? It kind of does in the back of your head. Like, yes, because this clerk decided to come to work today, he obviously doesn't come prepared to get robbed, but he came into work today. Why? Because he needs to have money to be able to pay his bills. Why? Because he probably has to. He he needs somewhere to live. Why? Because he can't live in the street. Like it it just it's this like kind of a domino effect in a way, right? Like it's kind of a domino effect. Yeah, I would say that like it snowballs. It snowballs mm -hmm. into a way that like when it builds up, it can't be stopped. Like this is it. This is the, this is what's gonna happen. But the only way, the only thing about that is that Javier Bardem goes into an extreme. Like okay, fate puts you in my hand, yeah. and I'm gonna kill you now. Like it's just like okay, wait. Hold on. If people could be redeemed, but uh, yeah, it, it's very interesting that it's interesting in that sense that they take that like, no, this is fate. Like you do some. It, it's not even like you. You are a horrible person. It's just like, um, the way he sees it is that when people get in his way, that's just fate saying, you know, it, it's your time. It's your time to go. He doesn't do it gruesomely. He doesn't like make people suffer. He's just like, nope, I'm gonna kill you. Go on to the next one. And I think that flip point. That, that point that you talk about when he starts thinking of it as a game too, like, okay, I have competition yeah. now, is when he moves away from that idea almost where he's like, this isn't fate anymore. This is kind of personal to me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but is there anything else you wanted to bring up? Maybe, because uh, I know I, I gave you my notes. I don't know if you were, had something that you wanted to bring up before we kind of wrap it up here. I, I actually wanted to talk about, you, you, you talked about this before, the parallels when he goes into, which is one of my favorite scenes, when he pays the people to get into Mexico. Yeah. And it, it's just so interesting to see like what 
the desperation people are for like for money. They want money. That guy what comes to you bleeding and he's like, Oh, give me the shirt for five hundred like more. I yeah. want more money. Like that guy that guy the guy's wanting more money. And it almost shows you the opposite of that. When when Javier Bardem is talking to the, the kids, mm -hmm. the kid's like, You can have it for free. Like don't get don't give me any money. And it's like their innocence. Yeah. And um and, and, and I I don't know. Why do you think that he did get in that car crash, man? Like, what do you think? What are your thoughts on that? Like, do you think that was like fate saying like, hey, this like, you're no, you're not special to fate too? I think in a way, yeah. It's kind of saying like, hey, you're, you're, you're not, you are redeemable, but you're not um, immune to what can happen. You know, you're not, you're not, um, you're, it's your destiny. It was your destiny to find those $2 million. What's it called? And in a way, it was like it's his destiny. Uh, it was Sugar's destiny. So what's it called to to hunt down this guy for his two million dollars, for the two million dollars? And it's like, oh, but I'm not bulletproof. I've gone this whole movie, I'm thinking that I'm in the position of power, and now that I've been reduced down to my most vulnerable, like I've been shot in the leg, I've been what's it called? Uh, I've I've been, I've had to you know. Uh, heal myself i've had to do all these things i've had to blow up a car in a pharmacy just to get freaking medicine to, to heal myself i'm not as bulletproof as i as i think and in a way i think that's also where pride comes in there it's like he prides himself at being this untouchable person and, and like that's why i feel like he has so much fun killing these people and why he's like he's so methodical in the way that he does it like he doesn't feel like a rush from from killing them he fe he has a he feels the rush because he knows that he's smarter than them and that's why that's why he carries a freaking oxygen tank <laughs> to suck in the the what's it called the 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 doorknob because he knows that he's always two steps ahead of everybody but what happens is that in the in his most vulnerable state fate reminds him no you're you're expendable too you're extendable you're expendable. I'm sorry. You're expendable too, and you can die too. And you're what? What's gonna happen is you're gonna get minimized to the same position that Llewellyn is in, where he has to ask for a piece of clothing. But what's the difference is that you're talking to kids, and kids aren't as easily corrupted as older people are. And they're like, "No, I'll do it for free." Yeah, man. That's like that. That's yeah. That's a that's uh, to me. That's a super great analysis, man. Because it's like uh, even after like. If he he had killed the wife, like when she said, "No, I'm not choosing, I'm not choosing the coin flip," and he still kills her, it's like, okay, then that wasn't fate. Like he chose to kill her in that sense. Yeah, and in a way, like, and I think it is like kind of a come up like karma in the sense where it's just mm -hmm. kind of like, hey, then you your your hands at the same the same with fate and it's interesting you bring that up right because that moment with Llewellyn's wife where she doesn't want to choose and like fate has no play in it anymore it kind of takes away the mystique of sugar and I feel like that's why that's why where that's why the accident happens there and it's like oh there it is yeah. the final part is stripped from him he's been hunted but now the part where he can be judge, jury, and executioner has been stripped away from him, and he has no power in deciding people's fate anymore. Yeah, and he's clamoring around just like uh, just like Josh Brolin's character was. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Desperate. He was desperate in need for stuff, for for um, for help, for aid, and he can't just do it alone anymore. He can't just go clean up his wounds. He has to like, hey, you never saw me here, like, and walk off into the to, to sunset, the sunset. But like, his injuries. He's gonna have to go to the hospital, right? You yeah. can't heal with a broken bone sticking out of your arm like that. So um, it, it's almost like it, it's ambiguous, but not really. Like, hey, this is what happens in the in the West. Like when you're when you live in a in a in a a nonsensical kind of way. When you live with when your morals are like, okay, well he he doesn't have morals. This is how what this is what happens. Like it's it is comeuppance almost. Yeah. You know, exactly. But it's a good, I mean, that, that part's so good because then you go into Tommy Lee Jones 
and he talks about it. He talks about, you know, the title of the movie, you know, why he it's it's just his time to retire. And yeah. it's uh the world is 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 he's losing something of the world, but um it's tough, man. Kind of in a uh, way, like the more time he spends in the forest, the more time he becomes less human. He's like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I would I would see that too, man. Like it, it's perspective in that sense too. He's gaining more perspective more than he's ever gained. Um he you know, he starts off the movie with such a cold line saying that like how they had to kill this kid that that killed his girlfriend. And at the end of the movie, he's like, the 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 my old age has gotten to me, and I can't get back to it. And that that's in a sense fate too. Like sometimes it's just a cycle. It's a cycle of 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 uh, a violence, I suppose. You know. Yeah. At least in the confines of this movie, yeah, it's a cycle of violence, and it just doesn't yeah. stop. And it's uh, it's just it's it's every time, and it just happens, and. You know, as as much as Tommy Lee Jones' character would love to just solve it all, it just keeps coming back yeah. and coming back. Yeah. But um, yeah, and I think that's why I like this movie, man, because it's like it's bleak, and I don't I don't mind if you. I love bleak movies, man. Me too. Bleak movies are yeah. like really good. Too. Yeah. It's it's bleak. They make you feel. But it also just has its moments of saying like, hey, there's still good people in this world. You had those kids who like. Yeah. You know, they didn't care if he was bad. Dude, they didn't even know he was bad, but they didn't care. They were willing to just help him. And, literally give them the shirt off their backs mm -hmm. so you know there's yeah, all this, there's yeah there's all that yeah that slither of hope yeah but um i think we're done here right man yeah man all right that was good that was a good conversation it was awesome man i loved it we had a great time this is gonna be a, a really fun one to put out there for everybody and i hope uh yeah. you all enjoyed it as much as i did because this was a really good time but like i've always said Nathan, you're not done here. You're in the hot seat now. Who are you pissing off because you're going to take a movie from them? Okay. So what movie are you going to return for season three of The Cinema Condition to discuss? Okay. The movie that I choose, um, hopefully nobody's seen it, or maybe they have. It's called The Skin I Live In. Antonio Banderas, great movie. And oh. I'm actually very excited to talk about it with you. Love that movie. Yeah, man. Dude, Almodovar. One. Almodovar is a great director. Uh, yeah. We I'm, should we should watch it with Marissa. She's never seen it before, so we should watch it all. Oh, my God, yes. We need to watch this with Marissa. Because, <laughs> oh, God, there's a lot of things that you can discuss within the skin I live oh, in, yeah. though. Oh, yeah. But, um, okay. yes. Oh, that just makes me more excited to rewatch this movie down the road. Because... <laughs> I didn't know Marissa's never seen this, man. Also, just Antonio Banderas, legendary actor, too. Yeah, He's wonderful. Yeah. Nathan, you want to tell them where they can find you? Tell them where they can find the review crew and all that cool stuff? Yeah, man. Um, so you guys can find us on our YouTube channel. My wife and I have a uh, movie review channel. It's called The Review Crew. Um, we discuss movies like The Polarizing, The Foots and Boots, and... Um, also, just fun movies like Fast and Furious franchise stuff. So if you guys want to come check us out, come watch, come listen. Um, and yeah, come feel, feel free to contact us or, or leave some comments if you guys hate hate our reviews. <laughs> you, come on, y'all. They're good. They're good. They're good reviews. They're good. She's good. She's good. She's good in them. I'm, uh, I'm okay. Nah, you guys do great, man. I love the videos. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. I really hope y'all uh, get more subs, get more people to come watch because... They're really good. They have a really interesting insight, even though like you know, a lot of it is fun and games, right? <laughs> they're being funny and stuff, but there's still some interesting insight in there. You know, I love that you guys finally talked about RRR. That movie is amazing. Yeah, that it is amazing. We're gonna watch it on our uh, on our flight back home. I I had Marissa download it, and so now we're gonna watch it. Yeah. Thing. and so she, we're excited. We're so excited. We're so excited. Yeah, I finally got the chance to watch that in theaters. I will tell you that no amount of screens like an iPad or a television can do it justice. You have to watch that movie in the theaters. In the theaters. Because it is batshit crazy to see everything on that on that movie screen in the theaters. Did, oh. get, did you get up and dance with them? I would have. I would have, yeah. I was I was like I was just like <laughs> you know, I don't yeah. know how to do the not to man. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Marissa's learning. She le she actually knows how to do it pretty decently so I'm like she's pretty ah, good. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry, y'all. I can do a cumbia, but I can't do a natu. Sorry. <laughs> but, um, yeah. 
I hope you all enjoyed it. Of course, you can keep up to date with me on all things social media by following me at the Nerdy Chicano. That is on Twitch. That is also on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, Letterboxd, and Serialized. Check me out on all those. I always help you all out by following you guys back and discussing movies with you all because I love talking about movies with you all. Uh, of course, I would also appreciate if you're watching this on YouTube, please subscribe to the channel. Please leave a like on this video and click that notification bell so you don't miss a single piece of content that drops on the channel. Also, if you're watching this or listening to it, I'm sorry, is what I should say. If you're listening to this on audio platforms like Apple Podcasts and Spotify, they give you the option to drop a review. So go ahead and just take that finger, scroll all the way to the five stars, drop it in there. It would help us out a lot here on the Cinema Condition. It's really appreciated, and, you know, just do it. Like like Shia said, just do it. Just also, do it. if you want this episode early, like my one patron has access to it, along with other episodes of the Cinema Condition that are actually available right now for what's it called, uh, early, all you need to do is go over to patreon.com slash the nerdy Chicano. You get... Videos just like this one, this episode of this podcast uh, early. You also get my reviews on physical media early. And you also can get some cool exclusives like video essays. I have two up at the moment. I have one on the cinematography of Come and See. And then I also have a discussion on Andrei Tarkovsky's Stalker up uh, for y'all. So check that out. I'm still working on my next one. It's not easy making video essays, guys, but they're fun. So go and check that out for early access and exclusives. Patreon.com slash Nerdy Chicano. Now, I'm going to be saying goodbye to you all. We all were done here. We had ourselves a lengthy discussion. I really liked having Nate's in here. Dude, I appreciate you, bro. I only got only got love for you, man, and I'm glad that we finally got to do it. Yeah, man, I'm excited for the next one, honestly. It's been fun. Yeah. And also just thank you again for coming in and taking that spot because I was like, I was running out of, of people to go to. I was like, if Nate was going to say no, I was going to say, fuck it. I'm going to have to ask Marissa and see if Marissa can do it. <laughs> but um, I thank you so much. No, bro. man, I'm always here, man. I, uh, yeah, yeah, you have a good one now. Of course. And and to you all. And y'all go sign up for that Patreon. Yeah, please. Please, y'all. It would be very much appreciated, y'all. <laughs> the money it costs to rent movies isn't cheap, y'all. Um, and at least that's what it would help out with. <laughs> Renting some of these movies when I don't have access to them. Wink, wink. But without further ado, I would like to thank you all so much for joining us for this episode. We'll catch you all in the next one. Of course, like I said, I'm not teasing you all on what's coming next because I don't know what order I'm, I'm recording these. But I know that they're coming out. So we'll catch you all in the next episode of Cinema, uh, Cinema Condition. And as always, to my wonderful cinephiles and renowned scholars, celebrate the love of cinema today, tomorrow, and every day after. That's your only thing I